privilege to be with you today and ask you to turn, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians and chapter number 5. First Thessalonians chapter number 5 and commence reading at verse number 16. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, Abstain from every appearance or every form of evil, and himself, the idea of the word there, himself, the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your entire, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord, by the Lord that this epistle be read. Unto all the holy brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now we know that God will add his blessing to the public reading of his word. I think all here are familiar with the origins of the assembly in Thessalonica. Paul, after seeing blessing and after receiving a beating in Philippi, moved to the city of Thessalonica in what is today modern day Greece. While there... He preached in the synagogue at least three Sabbath days, saw blessing and salvation. Likely, if we understand other portions of the Word of God properly, he spent more time there as well. Beyond that, three weeks preaching to Gentiles, saw an assembly planted, and because of the uproar in the city, moved on. Having moved on, he heard of problems that had occurred. Among them were the persecution and the suffering of the saints. And he picked up his pen and wrote what we have now as the first letter to the assembly in Thessalonica. It, of course, is very well known for the theme of the coming of the Lord Jesus, mentioned in every chapter with different aspects, different emphasis placed in each chapter or in the Lord's coming. But as well as you read the epistle, you realize Paul was writing for a number of different reasons. He was writing, first of all, or not first of all, but among the other things, to express his delight in them. Here were a company who were standing and their faith was holding fast amidst tremendous persecution from their fellow citizens. So he was writing to express his great delight in the believers there. He was writing as well to encourage them amidst all that they were enduring, the death of some who had been taken home and other issues in the epistle that are highlighted. He was writing likewise to enlighten them as to doctrine. Of course, that is the great teaching of chapter 4. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. And so he gives them a revelation concerning the rapture and how believers will be brought with the Lord Jesus Christ when he establishes his kingdom upon earth. He writes as well to explain and to rather to explain concerning his absence from them. And some were using that as a means of accusation against Paul. And finally, he is writing to explain, to exhort them as to some disorder that was occurring. Now, he does more of that in the second epistle, but he touches a bit on it here in this epistle as well. But as well, he is very, very concerned, as I think most of us are, in his writing with the preservation of testimony for God. So in chapter 1, he brings to the fore the scriptures, and their power. The word of God had come to them, the word of God had worked in them, and the word of God had issued from them. So in chapter 1, the scriptures are to the fore for the preservation of assembly testimony. And we hardly, hardly need emphasize the place the word of God should have in assembly life, in the preservation of testimony for God. In chapter 2, Paul is seen as a shepherd, and he emphasizes their shepherd care for the assembly. And along with the word of God, the scriptures, the tremendous need for shepherd care. And as there are young believers here, we would like to exhort young men to be exercised about the preservation of God's testimony and the need of shepherds 
in God's assembly. And young sisters should also be aware that if God is calling a young man to care for the assembly, it is going to mean a sacrifice for you as well. And if that is not your cup of tea, then maybe a man who has an exercise for shepherding the sheep is not the man you should burden in any way. In chapter 3, he's talking about their steadfastness of their faith amidst persecution. Five times over in that chapter, he mentions the word faith, faith. And their faith was growing. Their faith was evident. It was glowing. And so in chapter 3, it's all about faith. Chapter 4, it's the need of sanctity. How ye ought to walk and please God, even your sanctification. And holiness of life is vital if assembly is going to be preserved. And in chapter 5 here, which we are going to be looking at together, he's going to be speaking about spirituality in our relationships. And in the verses we have read together from the end of this chapter, he is going to be dealing with our relationships one with another. I cannot emphasize, now I, don't, I know I'm probably not the oldest one here, uh, but I'm getting there. That's kind of scary. These young men that come along to preach with me, uh, it's nice to have them. I was noticing uh, they both were born out of the country. I'm the only American here. I should have a flag or something to wave. But nevertheless, beside that. One of the tragic histories of assembly life. Not doctrinal difficulties. Not the invasion of false cults. But our inability to get along. And the tremendous problem of interpersonal relationships. Now I'm not here to give you a, a lesson in psychology on interpersonal relationships. I have my difficulty as well because unfortunately I still battle so many aspects of the flesh. But we have here in chapter 5, at the end of chapter 5 especially, one of the great things necessary to see assembly blessing and assembly preservation. Mentioning to some of the younger men earlier in the week that uh, some of the things that are necessary for dew to fall upon the earth is a clear atmosphere and temperatures above freezing. And I think the analogy can be made in assembly life. If we want to see the dew of divine blessing, we need temperatures above freezing and we need a clear atmosphere. And I'm going to speak to you now just for a few moments about a clear atmosphere in God's assembly. This end of this chapter can be very easily remembered by every young Christian here. We read together in verses 16 to 18 of an attitude that I should cultivate. An attitude to cultivate. We read in verses 19 down to verse 22, and this will take some explaining, an appreciation to regulate. And finally, when we come to the end of the chapter, verses 23 down to verse 28, an awareness to motivate. Now, an easier way of remembering it is just this. In the first section, it's the will of God for us. In the center section, it's the word of God to us. And in the final section, it's the work of God in us. Get that again? The will of God for us. The word of God to us. And the work of God in us. In this final section of Paul's letter to the believers. So just consider with me, if you will, I know I'll have to do this very hurriedly, and I do apologize, but I trust that we can convey to you something of the tremendous import of what is contained just in this final section. So often we come to the end of Paul's letters and we, uh, we kind of write off the, the, the last few verses as though they're just kind of uh, final greetings and uh, the way he winds down. But really there is tremendous truth. Likely there are young believers and you've come to this conference and upon your heart is this question, what is the will of God for my life? Now I don't want to minimize, I do not want to minimize in any measure the need to be exercised about the will of God for your life. But I want to also say that 99% of the will of God is in this book already. Very clear. Don't have to sweat it. Don't have to spend hours praying about it. Don't have to wonder and struggle and labor. 99% is right here in this book for you, openly, clearly, enunciated. And there's three things here that are the will of God for your life. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. 
So I want to just touch for a moment, if I can, on praise, on prayer, and and on perception. In everything, rather, rejoice evermore, he tells us here. Praise avoids self-pity. There is likely no, no voluntary emotion which is so self-destructive as getting into the habit of self-pity. Why is life so hard on me? Why does this happen to me? I deserve better. Tragically, we live in a society, a culture all around us, that is telling you day by day of all you deserve, all you ought to have, all you should go after. And we develop an entitlement mentality that somehow we are deserving of things. And when they don't happen, when we don't receive them, when things don't work out the way we want them to be, we develop this tremendous, destructive attitude of self-pity. Avoid a grumbling, negative spirit. Don't bring into God's assembly a cloud, a spirit of negativity, a sense of entitlement, a sense of self-pity. He warns us here about that. And he tells us here, we are to develop a spirit of thanksgiving. Rejoice evermore. If nothing else, you're on the way to heaven. But think of how much more you have to to be thankful for day by day. There are other brethren here that can attest to this as well. When I, um, you'll forget, I don't want to become political or go on a soapbox. But uh, when I see complaining and demonstrating about different things in this country, I think some people should travel to third world countries. And they would, want, they would be amazed. Our lower class is living like the middle and upper class in many third world countries. And everyone is walking around complaining about how poor they have it. We are richly blessed materially, nationally, but I think especially spiritually. And so we should avoid any, any descent into this tremendously dangerous attitude of Self-pity. Someone has described self-pity as it feels so good to feel so bad. Right? But it only lasts a second. And then it's back again. So, number one, praise. Number two, prayer. Prayer, if praise avoids self-pity, prayer avoids self-reliance. Self-reliance. Prayer as an attitude of my heart. Now, we all know, if you... uh, if you want to think about uh, crisis prayer, you, you go to the book of, of Nehemiah. And time after time, Nehemiah just suddenly raises a, a, an SOS, a crisis prayer to heaven, and uh, moves on. But of course, the, um, the first instance you see when he's standing before the king, and the king says, why are you so sad this day? And Nehemiah prays to the Lord and answers the king. That had followed four months of closet prayer. If you want your crisis prayer to be answered, make sure you know something of closet prayer. I sometimes wonder, this is not directed at anyone, so please don't take it personally. Men that can get up and pray for 10 or 15 minutes in the prayer meeting, I sometimes wonder how long they pray privately. I'll just leave that for you to consider. Anyway, so there's... uh, Prayer as an attitude of dependence upon God. Prayer as as an expression of dependence. We are a tremendously needy people. Now please do not ask me to explain that the mystery, if I can call it that, of prayer. How prayer fits in to the sovereign purposes of God. The best I can tell you is this. That God has chosen an incredible mercy and kindness to use our praying along with his sovereignty wedded together to accomplish his purposes. God needs none of us. God does not need my prayers. God does not need my preaching or my help. God was able to create this tremendous universe without my help. And he can carry it on and he can do exactly as he pleases. But he has chosen to give me the opportunity to work with him in prayer. And so we are reminded of the expression of dependence, our reliance upon God, whether for for ministry like this, Gospel effort, day-to-day living, being able to be preserved in a, in a very, very difficult age. But here is what is going to be a tremendous preservative to assembly life. Not just our prayer meeting, as vital as that is, but believers who live in the atmosphere of prayer. Prayer is also a, really it is a spirit of worship. 
prayer is really not, is really not uh, divorced from worship. Because when we pray, we are actually acknowledging the sufficiency, the sovereignty, the satisfaction that only God can give. It is, it is in a sense, really an attitude of worship as we come with our requests. And so we are reminded here of praise that avoids self-pity, of prayer that avoids self-reliance, and then of a spirit of perception that avoids self-centeredness. What I mean by that is this. He says here, in everything give thanks. I need to begin to perceive God in every circumstance in life. That everything in life should be a window into the heart and character of God. I was thinking, uh, those of you who were privileged to hear the excellent word our brother gave last evening in the prayer meeting. He was speaking about the frustration of waiting in an airport for delayed flights and all that. And uh, he didn't know that, but uh, I was in a traffic jam coming up here last night. And uh, I am not known for my patience. Uh, and I was getting increasingly, fr especially uh, traffic jams make people do crazy things. Driving along the right side of the road on the, you know, on, on the uh, lane that you're not supposed to drive in to cut into other people and uh, everything going crazy. And then the, come to the painful awareness that my lack of patience is due to a sense of over-importance of who I am. Sorry, that's the truth, right? I'm not saying that all frustration is due to a, a sense of how important I am. But my lack of patience is because don't they know I have to be here? Don't they know I've got to get... There is something bigger than I am in this world. God is doing something far more than getting me where I have to get from point A to point B when I want to. There's someone far wiser than I am in this world. God is working out purposes. And so with all of the circumstances that seem so negative, all of the things that seem so inconvenient, to realize that behind it all, there is a sovereign God who is working his own will. Just comes to mind now, and I, I, you'll forgive a personal reference, but like Andrew, a um, number of years ago, I was to fly with a couple of other brethren to Hong Kong. Our flight was first canceled. They booked us on another flight the next day. That flight was delayed. Didn't get out. The next day it snowed. The flight was canceled. And we had to abort our trip. The result of that was that a young man got saved. Now it would have been nice to have gone to Hong Kong. But I would give a hundred trips to Hong Kong for seeing a person saved. God was working. I was frustrated. Very frustrated. Yet God was working. Amidst all of your negative circumstances in life, amidst all of the unexplained hiccups, speed bumps, or even tragedies, keep in mind, there is someone wiser than you. There is something bigger than you. God is at work. The will of God for you. Quickly, the word of God to us. As you read these scriptures, you wonder, what's he referring to here? Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things. Well, now you've got to go back to first century Thessalonica, or Corinth, or, or Ephesus, wherever you want to go. There was no New Testament to which they could point. A man could not get up and read and say, we're going to turn to Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to speak. No. He says, I have a message from God. A man would stand forth in the assembly, a prophet, and say, I have a message from God. And he would give his message. And people would be sitting there listening. And he says, now be very, very careful that uh, you don't quench the spirit. Now that just means this. How could that man ever have a, have a word from God? I mean, I'm not going to bother listening. I'm not going to bother listening. So he tells us, avoid cynical listening when the word of God is preached. Don't immediately dismiss someone because you don't happen to like them. Always remember, that the word of God stands on its own. Now the man that's standing here has the responsibility to so live that his life is consistent with what he's preaching. But a bad man saying a good thing doesn't make it wrong. And a good man saying a bad thing doesn't make it right. The word of God always stands on its own. And we are responsible for how we view the word. So he says avoid cynical listening. Then he says um, not only quench not despise, despise not prophesying. Don't put down somebody's word 
just because you know something in his life that maybe, you know, I know, you know, I know what he did once. I know that 30 years ago, he says, avoid, avoid critical judgment. But then he says, prove all things. He says, avoid passive listening. That means just don't take everything in. Just don't believe everything you hear, even at this conference. While I have complete confidence in the men who are going to be speaking, everything that is spoken must be judged by the word of God. Is it consistent with what God has already revealed? Is it consistent with the whole word of God, or is this just someone's own particular hobby horse that he's riding today? And so we are reminded here, avoid passive listening. But then he says, hold fast. Avoid sermon sampling. What I mean by that is this. Sometimes, conferences, young people's gatherings can become spiritual entertainment. You know, we don't go to the movies, uh, we don't go to the dances, well, we have to have some entertainment, so we come to a conference. And we just sermon sample. Oh, that was nice that he said, that was nice that... No. Allow the word of God to have its effect this weekend on your life. You may be surprised that men who pray about the weekend, a weekend such as this, they pray just as much the word of God will change believers as we do that the word of God will reach sinners. That's what we're looking for in this weekend. Not just a nice, I mean, it's wonderful after over a year and a half that we can be together, that we can have a conference, that we can meet where we're meeting. It's wonderful. But we're not just looking for a wonderful time. Our desire is that the word of God will have its intended effect on every life that is here. Every one of us in some way adjusted by the word of God and its influence upon our life. It's said that the, uh, the famous missionary, David Livingston, when he was leaving for Africa, when he was traveling in Africa, he, had, uh, he took all his library with him. And, uh, I think it weighed 180 pounds, 300 and some books weighing 180 pounds. And back in those days, they would be carried on the backs of servants. He went a certain distance and uh, he had to throw away some of his books because the men just couldn't take it anymore. And finally, by the end of his journey, he only had one book, his Bible. Every other, every, every other thing had to go. Now, I'm not saying that you should not read books because I have a big library. But I am saying that this book should have the place of prominence, priority in your life. Avoid just sermon sampling. And then he says, abstain from every form of evil. Make sure the word of God has its intended effect upon your life. And it brings about change. Preserving you for God and for the assembly. So, the will of God for us. The word of God to us. Finally, the work of God in us. Assembly preservation based upon all of this. The work of God in us. He says, I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body. Actually, he's praying, I think, I pray God that the entire assembly and the entire person be preserved blameless. Are we passionate about sanctity? That may sound like a, a strange wedding of two words, passion and sanctity. But that's what Paul is speaking about here. Having a passion about sanctity. Paul desired. Chapter 4, he exhorts them. The will of God there is their sanctification. Again, no, no need to question doing something if it is going to in any way mar your sanctification. And here he says, I pray God your entire being, spirit, soul, body, be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus, and so on. I don't want to seem like I am a killjoy. I, I think Christian life should be a joy. But you will have to appreciate that God's ultimate purpose for your life and mine is not happiness. It's holiness. And some of the things that are intended to make you holy 
are humanly speaking the least likely to make you happy. Again, I, I don't want to come across as though God is somehow a, someone who doesn't believe in joy and pleasure. But some of the things that are going to make you holy in life are going to make you very unhappy when they happen. Problems, difficulties, canceled flights, okay? And they, they begin to, to hone you and begin to give you insights into yourself and you realize, I'm acting like everyone else. I'm, uh, I'm just... I, I'm getting impatient, I'm getting frustrated, I'm getting angry, I'm, I'm just like everyone else. They make you unhappy. But God's goal is to make us holy. And so we are reminded here to be passionate about holiness. He's going to, he really recurs to this theme throughout the epistle. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we all left a conference like this with a desire that our lives might be marked by greater holiness for God? The psalmist speaks of the beauty of holiness. And if there is beauty in, holy, then, in holiness, then the life of the Lord Jesus must have been the most beautiful life, just for that reason, that was ever lived here upon earth. Young sister, young brother, amidst a society, a culture, that tells you it's absolutely insane to remain pure. And it is difficult. It gives tremendous pleasure to the heart of God to see a young man, a young woman, a middle-aged man, middle-aged woman, whatever it may be, to see them maintain purity in life, holiness that is beautiful to the eye of God, being passionate about sanctity, being prayerful for his servants. Paul here asks for prayer as well, getting your eye on the needs of others, an assembly that is just self-contained and uh, just looking in at itself. Paul says, get your eyes on all that God is doing in our world. Pray for the servants of God, the missionaries, the, the servants in this land and in Canada, wherever they may be. Be prayerful for servants. Love for the saints, as he mentions here. And he, met, he ends by saying, charge that this epistle be read. Be, hold dear thee the scriptures. Give the word of God its place among the believers. God's work in us is to create holiness of life, to create a love for the saints, to create a horizon that is filled with the needs and the work of God elsewhere, and one that holds dear the word of God and his truth. May God help us. Assemblies preserved by being aware. Of, first of all, the will of God for us, of the word of God to us, and of the work of God in us.